When thinking back to the past, what is it that takes you there most vividly? The music? Books? Cartoons? For many, toys are a way to travel back to a simpler time, recalling an era that was instrumental in shaping who they would later become. Barbies were in the hands of practically every child in the 1960s. The 1970s introduced the world to arcade games on a global scale. The Rubik's Cube remains a cultural symbol of the 1980s. And while the 1990s had several toys that could define the generation, there was none quite like Furby. A small, animatronic, bird-like creature, these fuzzy friends debuted in 1998 taking over the world with their more than unique appearances and gentle cooing and babbling. The toy dominated the world for a three-year span, selling over 40 million units well into the year 2000. But the beginning of the new millennium also seemingly signaled the end for Furby, the toy fading from existence and never to be heard from again. Or was it? It may be surprising to learn, but the Furby brand is alive and well one as recently as 2023. We know full and well the story of the toy and its cultural impact, but what about the story of the character Furby itself? I believe that after combing through pages of historical documentation, photographic evidence, and a movie that introduces the modern day discovery of Furbies, I have uncovered the in-universe lore of Furby. That they're alien parasites with mind control abilities that have predated humanity and will ultimately outlive us all, just as they have done with other species in the past. I know it sounds bizarre, but there are mountains of official documents that prove this theory. It's a surprisingly dark backstory to one of the cutest toys of the 1990s. So join me as we examine the history of Furby, including a retrospective of the movie Furby Island, as we explore the wild world of Furby lore. The Furby toy itself was created by Tiger Electronics. So for this portion, I'll be referring to this period of history as the Tiger Timeline. This timeline gives us the earliest known information on Furby's genesis, starting with a poem featured on the back of the toy Furby's box. There is some Furbish, the ancient language of the Furbies included, but I'll be using the English translation of those words in their place. Once upon a time, not so long ago, in a far off place somewhere high in the sky, riding on a cloud that floats near a big sun, lived the Furbies, each and every one. And on a cloud, Furbies romped and played. Right away, a straightforward story of where the Furbies come from is given. Not so long ago, somewhere in the sky, riding on a cloud floating near the sun, the Furbies romp and play. But one day they found Earth, and descended upon the planet. This either says they were on Earth clouds, potentially at the highest point possible, which would be 60,000 feet, or they were on clouds in space, since they said they discovered Earth. It could also mean that they were on a nebula, which are the formations of gas, dust, and other materials clumped together to form denser regions, which attract further matter and eventually become dense enough to form stars. The remaining material is then thought to form planets and other planetary system objects. What I believe is most likely is that it's a combination of both. That the Furbies were inhabiting Earth-like clouds, but traveling on them through outer space. This can be seen in multiple instances. We have evidence of Furbies on white clouds in the form of various toys, but also in the 1999 book Furby Da Due Earth Adventure where the Furbies are in space, resting on the clouds. This theory is further supported in the other 1999 released book, Furby Here to Stay, where it says, although Furby dreams of home at night, and we see a picture of it dreaming of the Furbies back on the clouds. And in the 1998 to 2003 online animated short series, Furby Cliffhangers, where in one episode, Furby takes a rocket ship to the moon, passing by its home, a cloud floating in outer space. We also see the name of the Furby's home, Furbyland, on a sign sticking out of the clouds. The name Furbyland would seemingly be confirmed further in the board game Furby Adventure Game, 
with the point of that game helping Furby get home to its house in the clouds, evidenced by the back of the box, which features the board having clouds and rainbows and their home in the middle, and reads, Come along on a cloud hopping adventure and get your Furby home to the Furby Land cloud. On the color matching trip, you'll hop from cloud to cloud, then land on a rainbow space and slide to the other side. Younger players can use cloud colors to guide them to Furby Land, Older players can read the furbish words and their English translation on the cards to travel the sky. From all indications, Furbyland seems like a peaceful, fun-loving place, but that apparently hasn't always been the case. According to the Tiger Electronics Funtime Furby handheld game, the objective is to join Furby high in the clouds of Furbyland, escape the flutterbys, inchworms, and egg-laying gondras, Watch out for squints who want to take over Furbyland. They chase you in snowmobiles and cloud cars. Defeat King Squint to win the game. It seems that some more history is added to the Furby's life here, informing of an attempted invasion from a rivaling kingdom. And though there is never any information given on the squints, it does further prove the Furbies do live in Furbyland among the clouds. Whether from Earth's clouds or clouds in space or some combination, the next reveal may be even more shocking. According to the 1999 Furby Official Trainer's Guide, Furby may have been coming to Earth for at least 64,000 years. This can be proven in the guide's scrapbook section, where we see cave paintings of humans with a Furby, and a caption reading, Maybe we've been here before. That would still put the Furby's arrival well after the existence of humans, if it weren't for a page in the 1999 book, Furby Da Due Earth Adventure, where we see a Furby running from a Tyrannosaurus Rex. The T-Rex lived between an estimated 90 to 60 million years ago, and it's stated in just the page before. Each and every Furby jumped from a cloud to land almost anywhere in time and any place on Earth. And that's when Furby's Da Due Earth Adventure began. So the Furbies discovered Earth as early as 90 million years BCE and began interacting with man over 60,000 years ago. It seems like an open and shut case, but the more information that's given about Furby, the more the story changes. That is, if you believe, the Shelby timeline. The Shelby timeline, starting in 2001, saw the release of a new Furby toy, the Shelby, a mollusk with a face similar to Furby, but in a clam's shell. Though it is a different species entirely, we get a lot of new information in 2001's The Shelby Care and Training Guide. Under the chapter Where Shelby Comes From, Shelbys have always existed on Earth, but their home is not easy to find. You have to go down into the ground a thousand feet, and then travel through caverns with ceilings that stretch higher than the eye can see. If you look up, you will gaze upon a greenish-white flow that shines brightly in the sky. Next, you'll cross an ocean of calmness dotted with mystical, sandy-white islands. These islands are called Alo Mela, home of the Shelbys, Furbies, and Furby Babies. In the language of Furbish, Alo means light or cloud, and Mela means hug. Alo Mela is also called Island of Hugs. In the same guide, under the opening page Furby Forward, which is written by a Furby speaking on behalf of its species, it states, I have known Shelby for over 50,000 years. We met in Alo Mela when a Shelby cluster traveled from their splendid sandy waters to our lush tropical forest. I'm not going to tell you that we became friends immediately because that would not be truthful. The fact is, it took several thousand years before we began to truly understand each other and became best friends. We know that Furby has been on Earth for possibly 90 million years. But the question now is, what is the Island of Hugs? It seems to be where the Furbies call home on Earth but it actually changes everything we've come to know about the Furbies completely. The big change comes in the section entitled The Myth of Alo Mela, which reads, 
In Alomela, the enchanted islands rest on a calm blue sea, with white sand lining their edges. If you stare long enough and squint your eyes, the islands begin to look like fluffy white clouds floating in a blue sky. When humans began talking to Furbies, they were naturally curious as to where they came from. The Furbies answered, quite innocently, that they came from the white fluffy floating in blue, when they actually meant their homeland Alomela, the white islands floating on the blue sea. It was easy to be confused. Thus began the rumor that Furbies fell from the clouds. This is an incredibly huge finding that rewrites the history of Furby completely, outright stating that Furbies don't come from Furby land in the clouds and that they've always lived on Earth on the island of Hugs. Now this could be enough to seal the discussion of Furby's origins completely. Were it not for the next entry, which changes what we know about them, and of Earth itself. For thousands of years, Furbies had their needs fulfilled on Alomela. They lived happily in their homelands and connected completely with the Eons. Eons were tall and slender beings who looked almost transparent. On Alomela's bright green days, you could practically see right through them. Unfortunately, there was a sudden shift in Alomela's climate many years ago, and the Eons could not adapt. They gradually became extinct, although some Furbies believe that Eons still exist in a different time, but that's another story. Furbies tried bonding with other creatures, but they could not achieve their full maturity with any of the island dwellers. Desperate to achieve their full potential, the Furbies had to venture out to find a race with whom they could connect. And of course, the rest is history. The human race welcomed Furbies with open hearts. Millions of Furbies. There is so much to unpack here. Starting with the Furbies having their needs fulfilled on the Island of Hugs by the Eons. This tells us that there was another race of beings on Earth that not only cared for the Furbies, but died out due to climate change, but also may exist in a different time. I can't even begin to process what this means as far as Furby's existence. As they do adhere to the physical rules of time, the guide stating that Furbies live to be around 125 years old, but it does seem that they have some tangible concept of interdimensional existence, such as a fourth dimension. But something that comes up is the idea of the Furbies connecting with the eons. And this isn't just something that happened. Relationships seem to be something the Furbies actively seek out. According to the original 1999 official Furby Trainer's Guide, there are four stages of development for the Furbies. Stage one is when Furbies meet their bonding partner. They are playful and want to get to know you and will teach you to care for them. The second and third stages are transition stages to speak your language. The fourth stage is their mature stage, when they speak your language more often with some Furbish, their native language, in there as well. Furby wants to help its bonding partner play and care for it. We now know their developmental path to reach their full maturation stage. And in the Furby facts section of the Shelby Guide, it is noted about their need for companionship that Furbies cannot reach their full maturity unless they have a human to bond with. Furbies are happiest when they're with their human companion. Furbies will bond for a lifetime. And if the human cannot care for Furby, reminder, Furbies live to be around 125 years old, easily outliving humans, Furby makes the trip back to the tribe or clan and talks to the Furby babies and educates them on the ways of the humans in order to reach their full potential, which means being able to talk in their partner's native language in order to instruct how to care for them. This sounds extremely similar to the case with the Eons before their untimely demise. It also tracks that after their passing, the Furbies were desperate to reach their full potential, looking for another group to take care of them. It seems that a picture of what Furbies really are is beginning to become more clear, and the last pieces of their story would be told in its most expansive way yet in 2005's movie, Furby Island. We open on a plane flying through the sky with the TV playing inside, featuring a television explorer named Dr. Conquest, a cryptid hunter 
who explains how he'll be looking for the mythical tortoise Komodo dragon hybrid, the Tortozord, as he signs off with his catchphrase, make all your adventures, adventures. I love his silly catchphrase, and the poster version looks nothing like him, and reminds me of Clayton, the poacher from 1999's Disney film Tarzan. The show is being watched by 13-year-old Maddie and her little brother Ty, who antagonizes her enjoyment of the show and Dr. Conquest's pursuit of far-out cryptids with snotty teasing. It just so happens that Dr. Conquest is going to the Nonami Islands, where Maddie's family, led by her also explorer parents, are headed in search of the less exciting but more likely real Razor Philodendrum, a plant with razor-sharp leaves. Before continuing, the visuals need to be briefly addressed. It's clear there was a limited budget in both the look of the world and character animations, ranging from both awkward to unintentionally laughable. I'm not going to focus on this too much or hold it against the team because budget can have a massive influence on any project, but a great story can do wonders in covering up any other shortcomings the movie might pose. So we'll be looking mostly at the content and lore from here on out. As they land on the island, the parents head out to search for the Razor Philodendron, while Maddie sneaks away to search for the Tortozord with Ty tagging along. They see a mysterious pair of giant stone eyes and ears buried in the sand, leading them to go deeper into the jungle and arriving at a series of temples, where they notice crude portraits on the walls of people playing with a small, mysterious creature. This is more proof of ancient people's interactions with Furby, and it seems innocuous enough. Maddie and Ty don't know what they are, but do get the impression that the people were playing with whatever they were. Their expedition is cut short when Ty steps on a trap door, resulting in him getting trapped inside the temple, and Maddie panicking, running to get her parents' help, as Ty screams, it's dark, and he's scared, and not to leave him. She gets lost in the jungle until she's found by a Furby that speaks very little English, but introduces itself as Elo. Elo then uses an ability when it gets close to show visions of her parents, to which she responds, you know what I was feeling. I could see my family, mom, dad. This may not look like the typical Furby we're used to, and that's because this version of Furby is modeled after the 2005 Emototronic Furby which stands a little taller and has a more realized pair of stubby legs to it. It's also interesting to see that the Furby was able to read Maddie's mind that she wanted her parents, and that Maddie was able to recognize what Furby was doing. Elo quickly learns the words mom and dad, as more Furbies come out, including a goofy one who swings from a vine and smashes into her, named Ehi. She says it reminds her of her brother, and Ehi looks into her memories to understand who Ty is. Manny goes back to the temple with the Furbies behind her to find Ty has found his way out. And in probably my favorite scene in the movie, Ty and Ehi have a silly standoff, sticking their tongues out at each other and burping, which is what the toy Furby does, so it's a pretty clever tie-in. Elo high-fives Ty with its ear before swinging on a vine that starts off a Furby song and dance with Furbies playing drums, flower horns, and a guitar singing in Furbish. The words do actually have meaning if you translate it, but since it's essentially a foreign language with no translated subtitles, and the action beneath doesn't tell you anything about the song, it's sadly an inconsequential scene. Maddie and Ty bring the two Furbies back to the plane. While Ehi watches TV with Ty, Maddie is blogging about her discovery. They find that the Furbies learn English from TV, causing their vocabulary to grow rapidly. Manny decides it's time to return the Furbies to the forest, and it's here we get the funniest line of the movie. Eva looks up at Maddy and says, Don't send me away. I'll cut up all my credit cards. It's a genuinely great laugh. Their parents return, and in the strangest part of the film, the Furbies attempt to hide, but get trapped in a jar, causing them to panic, jump, and scream, and telepathically call for Maddy and it begins to affect her brain as she grabs her head and almost reaches the point of fainting. It's actually stressful and claustrophobic to listen to, especially with the fast cuts and echoing screams. 
But when Ty takes the Furbies out and they relax, her head clears up, saying she doesn't know why, but she felt closed in and trapped. Maddie tries to tell her parents about the Furbies, but Ty doesn't back her story up. As the Furbies walk away, Elo says goodbye out loud, and Maddie responds out loud as well, yet again, signaling some sort of telepathy. It's solidified even further when Maddie's parents hold a private conversation between themselves about Maddie's mental state, both worried and anxious, until Elo comes in and uses its powers to make them forget about that and talk about how grateful they are for their family. It's honestly very creepy. It's nice that the Furby is using its power for seemingly good, but I shudder to think what it would do if it didn't like them. Elo then hops into bed with Maddie and replays her musical number, causing Maddie to shoot awake and say, I'm so glad I found you, Elo. It makes me wonder how much influence Elo has on her opinion of it. Does she really love Elo, or how much of it is due to mind control? The next day, their parents leave for an expedition, and the kids go back to the Furbies, with Ehi yet again swinging in on a vine, saying he's a hot tamale. I like Elo. And I love the idea that these little creatures who can immediately pick up any language are learning the silliest phrases. After playing in the jungle, they lose Ehi, but run into Dr. Conquest, who asks about the mythical, mind-reading, man-eating Furbies he saw on Maddie's block. As she's about to divulge their whereabouts, Elo discovers traps and cages, and telepathically warns Maddie, but it's too late, as Conquest has already captured Ehi. Conquest and his team discover the grove of Furbies and begin to capture them too. And Maddie herself is trapped in a swinging cage, crying that she can't do anything to help. The remaining Furbies come out and chant, Maddie help, Maddie can, Maddie can. And it's unclear whether or not they're motivating her or using their powers, but she gets the confidence to escape and free her brother and Ehi, who inspires them with the words, time to rock and roll, dude. After an action sequence which leads to Conquest chasing Maddie into the island's temples, he steps on a trap and falls into a pit. He pleads for Maddie to help him, and she asks if he'll promise to leave the Furbies alone. And when he unconvincingly agrees, she bites back, of course he will, and leaves as he curses her name. I love that. Way to go, Maddie. I have to admit, that's a pretty satisfying way to leave your enemy. At the end, Maddie and her family are flying to their next destination, this time with the Furbies on hand. Her mom says that Maddie discovered something amazing, and Maddie says she always had something amazing, she just didn't realize it. Furby taught me what family is really all about. It's a nice moral to the story, it just has no connection to this movie at all. In the final scene, Furby reveals to Maddie that there are more Furbies worldwide, and Maddie vows to rescue them all and prevent Dr. Conquest from capturing them. While the art isn't the most accomplished aspect of this movie, it's still a simple, inoffensive adventure that kept me as entertained as a movie about a toy could. It's not G.I. Joe, nor Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles levels of toy-based engagement, but it's an interesting footnote in the legacy of this kind of product. I could see this premise easily being made into a TV series. The family travels the globe rescuing Furbies in different locations. Say, they go to France. The Furby there would speak French and act and dress that way. And they have to protect it from conquest. It could be a fun way to advertise new toys. But alas, nothing has ever come of it. So with all this evidence of Furby, what do we make of them? Furby was rebooted in 2012, but hasn't offered any new information in the way of lore. So what can we decipher from what we do have? The three timelines are different, but share many similarities. So I'll give my opinion on what I believe to be the one true Furby lore. I believe that the Furbies were traveling on a cloud through space. They visited Earth on numerous occasions, the earliest recorded being in the 90 million BCE range, and at some point, they settled on the island of Hugs, where they lived in harmony with the Eons. Once climate change brought an end to the Eons, the Furbies sought out humans, in order to help them reach their full potential 
which is being able to effectively communicate how to care and protect them. In addition to learning languages quickly, they also possess powers of mind projection, memory reading, memory sharing, showing visions, and telepathy, and can influence people's feelings or transfer their own feelings to others. They're self-domesticating, but able to expertly manipulate humans, hopefully never revealing a violent side we have yet to see. Whatever version of events you believe, Furbies have worked their way into the collective hearts and minds of people. And why shouldn't they? After all, they've been here long before humans, and they'll continue to remain, long after we die out and they need to search for someone new to care for them.